Ooh, that scared me. All right. I've never seen that. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> that yeah, that prompt lit, that just started like two weeks ago. Scared the piss wow. out of me the first time I did it too. Anyway, <laughs> gentlemen, a lot in the news today here for Pell's Plus Roundtable number four. Very excited for this one. First thing, I'm just gonna put it right out there unless y'all have something to say about it. I'm not gonna acknowledge the team leaving for Seattle BS. That's not worth our time. I don't think it's worth anybody's time. So unless somebody has some thoughts on that, I'm going to jump right into that Zion article. Anybody? No. No? Nothing. Okay, good. Don't waste your time. <laughs> so Zion article comes out from The Athletic today, Will Guillory, and it was Sham Sharania as well that put out the, the article saying Zion's family isn't happy with the Pelicans, the way they've handled things over the last two years. Um, initial thoughts on that, Jesse, since you're the new guy, I'll let you start off. I'm going to say it's, it's really hard to gauge where this team is at, these players are at and all that. I know for me personally, I haven't been around the team for what feels like it's probably close to two years considering just being busy and then COVID and all of that. So the, what it's like under David Griffin on the inside, I, I, I have no idea. Uh, it's totally – I know enough that it's totally different than the AD and Dell Demps era. Um, but as far as the way things are managed, uh, I think it's totally different. I think it's good to point that out because it seems to be that the road is perpetually judged by everything that happened in the past. Um but I don't think that what is happening now is inherently linked to the past, if that makes any sense. Um, I know that there's probably the same challenges in managing a small market team, but as far as um, the approach to how to build that team, I don't see it as the same at all, just from what I've been able to observe on the outside. Um, so as far as, Zion's family not being happy or wanting him to move. I don't, I don't know how much stock to put into that. Um, but I, I think it's also not unreasonable that a star player is upset if they're disappointed in the current state of things. Obviously there was some turmoil going on with uh, Stan Van Gundy and the players. Um, there was that cryptic, uh, the Keel Instagram post about <laughs> it was a roller coaster, but I appreciate you. I don't know what that means, but something <laughs> going on. <laughs> um, so, and that's kind of what we're left with now, like trying to decipher cryptic social media messages. And, um, you know, they're there. And to be honest, if I look around, uh, you know, the lead, the media that gets involved with the team. I don't think there really are a ton of insiders with this team. There's a lot of people that make general statements. Um, it seems like some, sometimes uh, things are biased. I don't want to say everything's fake news out there. And I, you know, just like the moving to the Seattle thing, I don't want to say like it's impossible or, or that it would never happen that the franchise would move out. But, uh, it just seemed like a bit of piling on <laughs> at the end of uh, – it's, it's like the vultures are flying around, you know. Um, so it, I don't know how much stock to put into any of this. It's a lot to di digest. It starts with, you know, you're going to have to find a new head coach again. Your star player is unhappy and wants to move out, and then the cherry on top is – Idle wave all of them, and it, you know, it, it, it's a lot. It's a it is a lot. I hope you're not talking right now, Jesse, because you're skipping a lot. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna... I wasn't. I oh, decided okay. to... <laughs> <laughs> we love the internet. Uh, Justin, I'll bounce it over to you. How are you feeling today? What are your thoughts on the article, etc.? Uh, gosh, I'm tired. I'm not gonna lie to you. It's been, um, <laughs> It's just been tough 48 hours. I was, you know, it's just, I was telling Jesse, like, I'm, and y'all before we got on the show, like, I'm, I'm extremely tired. Uh, the whole Stan Van Gundy uh, firing, um, 
kind of snowballed into everything, right? So the whole, it went into Sam Van Gundy, then the whole David Griffin presser. And then now this whole article comes out with Zion Williamson. I could kind of tell, I mean, let's call a spade a spade. Superstars don't want to lose. Uh, no one likes losing. Um, so to say he's disgruntled, yeah, I think everybody in on airline drive right now is disgruntled. Uh, I think it's a little weird that his family is has all this say in what Zion does. It kind of gives me a LeVar Ball-esque feel to it, but uh, I don't necessarily really care about that. Uh, winning cures everything. I, I, I mean, it is what it is. You got to win uh, and you got to start now. That's, I, you know, I've taken some flack with the whole patience thing. And I know it's been weird these last two years. Zion's been hurt in the bubble and all that different kind of stuff. Um, but it's time to win now. And I think that this statement um, makes David Griffin's seat a little bit warmer to where I think he'll be more aggressive uh, in the off season. I came in thinking he would be aggressive. Now I know for sure he's going to have to be aggressive uh, to, to get a winner and to stay, to sustain a winning uh, mentality that he promised would that he would implement three years ago. If anybody says sustainable winning on this podcast, <laughs> kicking you off immediately. Chris, sustainable success. Yeah, whatever. Chris, how about you, What's man? Up, man? What are your thoughts so far today on that on that Zion article? Um, I mean, look, uh, when you lose and there's uh, friction involved in your locker room, outside of your locker room, you know, you've uh, left back-to-back seasons in which your young players feel like there was something left on the table, there's some realm of disappointment uh, at hand. I mean, these things happen. Um, I mean, a, a bunch of things end up coming out. You know, we, um, you know, Justin mentioned that, you know, winning, winning cures everything. I, you know, I don't know if, it, if, if, if that is the case or, or if it isn't. But what I do know is winning allows you to get away with certain things. It allows you to, it allows you to gloss over certain things. Now they may eventually come back up. You know, I mean, we've seen multiple teams uh, win championships, and years later we find out that there was there may have been an issue here between a coach or a player, whatever the case is. And you'll be asking yourself, how the hell did they get through that? You know, but during that period of time, you're winning, so you kind of put some of that stuff to the side. Um, but when you're losing, everything just, just compiles on. Everything, everything's bad. Every, uh, everything that negatively that, that can be put out is going to feel 10 times worse. Um, and I think it's uh, what kind of also goes with that is the fact that you don't know as a supporter whether you're in the media or whether you're you know whether you're just a fan a blogger whatever wherever you stand you don't know where the solution lies you can't really predict what's next right it's not as simple as to say all right we bring in this guy and it's you know and we know we have a fix here okay this coach will do it this not only do you not know where you should go it's hard to piece together or predict which route they will go Will it be a big trade? Will it be a small trade? Will they draft a player? Will they trade a player? How will the lottery go? What coach, what type of coach will they bring in? Will they bring in someone from the outside? Will they promote someone up? Will David Griffin be the coach? No one knows what exactly is going to happen. So, I mean, it leaves everybody with a bit of anxiety. And then when you have a star player, you know, you know, you're a superstar trends, um, you know, a generational guy come out and, or not come out and say, but, you know, be rumored to have people within his circle. I, Look, I mean, I'm sure I have cousins in my family that don't like what I do for a living. Like, I have people all the time that want to know why I didn't go to college or why I didn't, or still to this day want me to go back to school. They're not happy with, with my decision making. I mean, family family gossip, family rumors, man. I mean, I mean, you know, we all have have stuff like that that's involved. I, when it's at the end of at the end of the day, even before Stan got fired, we knew that Griffin had to make something happen this offseason. And that hasn't that that didn't change. Um that didn't change yesterday and it didn't change today. That's that's what it comes down to. Period. Um anything else that comes with it, all the other nonsense and chatter and noise and rumors, it doesn't matter. Because guess what? If they're a competitive team next year, if they're winning basketball games, the person that matters the most, which is Zion, he'll be happy. And as long as that's going on, none of the other shit matters. Right. 
I yeah. think you all nailed it, honestly. And to add to a point, personally, obviously, <laughs> obviously, I'm not Zion Williamson. I'm 5'9 and white and in Iowa. So <laughs> we're not the same person. But at the age of really? 20. <laughs> okay, Chris. <laughs> at the age of 20, and honestly, now, if my family was really against whatever I was doing and I felt good about it, I would double down on it. Like that's just, I think that's a young individual, maybe a young man thing to do, especially. And I mean, again, Justin, you said it, it's a LeVar ball, Lonzo ball sort of thing. Let the kid speak for himself. Everybody mm -hmm. likes to say Lonzo is going to leave to New Orleans or sorry, New York, leave to Los Angeles, maybe the Clippers or whatever, wants to play for a big market, Chicago. Has he actually said that? Has he put that into, into the ether or whatever? I mean, if, and if, if these guys say it, fine, let's go with it. But the speculation and these rumors about family drives me up the wall. Like, I obviously, you got to do your job. You got to report. You got to do what you got to do. But still, I, I just, I'm not disregarding it completely because I don't know how much the family influences Zion, but it's not something that's at the forefront of my mind. Obviously, with all these questions, like Chris just mentioned, lottery, offseason, freaking coach now. It's just all these things. Who's coming back? What are you doing with your free agents? What are you doing in free agency to go get somebody else? There are too many other priorities than what Zion's family thinks of the Pelicans. Sorry. I, like, <laughs> it's a concern, but it's not a concern. Like, I, eh, you know? Uh, I mean, look, like – Anthony Davis's father wasn't happy with with a lot right. of things in New Orleans early on, right? You know, he wasn't happy with uh, with with Monty Williams when Monty was here and some of the things that right. happened afterwards. But there were things that could have happened for that team, for the franchise, whether it's the markets not getting hurt, whatever whatever the case is, there were things that could have happened that would have allowed Anthony to stay. I mean, I I, I at least I believe that. It, I, you know, so. I, Go ahead, Justin. I'm sorry, Chris. I didn't mean to cut you off. And, no, and no, 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 I think ahead. this is why Anthony Davis and Zion Williamson are different because Anthony Davis was looking to make himself bigger, right? He wanted to go. Zion Williamson is already worldwide. Like, if he goes to LA, he'll be just as big as he is in LA as he in New Orleans. Like, it doesn't matter where he goes. He's a worldwide icon. So yeah. to say that he needs to go to LA, like, Anthony Davis went to LA to do his brand thing and whatever. He's uh, Mr. Ruffles and all this. <laughs> And like, that's why his dad was kind of in his ear. I'm interested, like if the Pelicans get off to a really, really hot start this year, all that stuff goes away. Winning fixes, winning cures everything. Like that's the name of the game. Like no one wants to lose. I, like you, I know yeah. you don't want to lose. I know Jesse doesn't want to lose. I know Ellie does. Like, it doesn't matter. You just winning cures all, as you were saying, right? Like the bulls, like when you watch, you know, the last dance, you didn't realize all that stuff was going on It's because they were winning. Like it didn't matter because right. they were really just continuously winning and winning and winning. Right. So now with well, this is um, they Go need ahead. to, I, I think a lot of people need to kind of let David Griffin and the crew do what they're going to do. You know, they have a plan in place. Um, so let them have a shot at building this team. You know, superstars are going to say what they're going to say. And a lot of them, you know, they're, they're superstars younger and younger, you know, used to be kind of a guy who would become a superstar around age 25 or something now there's so many now that are coming in with a huge name brand and and zion's in a he's leading a new era of that he's leading an era of social media you know he was a star in high school and so they have a lot of power with their voice they know that they're going to say what they're going to say to try to get what they're going to get but a lot of these guys are very young coming in they don't understand the concept of building a team you know zion can say stuff like I really love playing with Lonzo and, and B.I. And I want all these guys to come back, but I also want to win and they need to surround me with good pieces. And, and you know, you, you, there, there's some of those ideas contradict each other. And at some point you're just going to have to take control of the team and say, you look, we're going to have to make aggressive moves. If your ultimate goal is winning, then trust what we're going to do. Uh, because we also can't bring back your friends just because you want to be with your friends, but then also win. And, you know, it, it's kind of a, 
con conflicting thing. But I, I think it doesn't matter whoever they ship out or trade or sign. If, like Justin said, if they start winning, the talk will calm down. Now that you mention it, Jesse, uh, first of all, in reference to Griff doing his thing, he's got to let the coach do his thing too. I'll just drop that in there. Right. Second thing. Uh, you, you mentioned Lonzo and the possibility of him bringing or coming back. Chris, I saw your tweet today, which was absolute gold, said that Gail Benson was going to offer Lonzo $30 million and then sign it in red ink. <laughs> um, <laughs> Chris has been on fire, by the way. <laughs> yep. And you guys, have, you guys have no idea how much fun I have at work when I'm, when I'm doing this thing. <laughs> I, I have so much fun, man. Because look, right, everybody, everybody's pissed. And, and and I mean, well, not everybody, but you you have a majority that you know that's that's depressed. They're going through PD, uh, PTSD, or they're pissed off, or you know whatever whatever the case is. And I can't help but think, you know, shit. Um, Lonzo Lonzo can just walk into the office like <laughs> with a with a Zion with a Zion fathead and just sitting on the desk like, okay, thirty mil. <laughs> it's right here. I mean, like, I mean, that's the first thing that pops in my head, man. So, I, I mean, I don't even know what your I'm, I'm sorry, Elliot. What was, what was your question? I, before Elliot answers that question, Go Chris, ahead. I think your tweet of Griffin wanting food was one of the funniest things I've read in close to maybe all year. I mean, literally, good. I was howling, howling in the bed. <laughs> it was gold, absolute gold. But go ahead. That was, that was I, I cannot. <laughs> I have about three minutes of a David Griffin press conference before I can just turn it off. I, I can't. I, I'm I'm the type. I will read. I will read the the transcript afterwards. But I cannot. I nope. I'm not going to go into that. Um. <laughs> um so Elliot, what, go ahead. Yes. Uh, so Chris, being the comedian of today's show, for those of you who aren't watching on YouTube, is wearing a shirt that says "That's a Hall, folks." So um. Lonzo Ball, is it any sort of reality that it's necessary to bring him back because Lonzo and B.I. want him back? Is that is that an actual thing that we'll have to talk about given Zion's supposed unhappiness? Uh, Chris, I'll start with you since you have the uh, golden tweet. Well, I mean, it shouldn't be, but unless you have a – I mean, I look, right? It, it it doesn't have to work that way if you have if you have an alternative in mind. Like if you have a plan and say, okay, if we don't bring back Lonzo, this is what we're doing and it's gonna work and it's gonna fit, right? And you are, I, you know, I mean, but no, it should not be. But the reality of it is, is that today's world, when we're talking about superstars and um, just how they're coming into the league, everything you said about brand and and, and how you know Jesse, you mentioned. You know, you know, Zion, Zion was a star. Well, no, Justin, both of you guys mentioned that Zion was a star when he came to the league. He had a million, a million social media followers, you know, before he stepped into into Duke, right? Um, so it's a lot different than it used to be when it comes to influence and power at such a young age. Um, I found it very interesting that Griff said something that I I agree with, that it is a lot. He doesn't think it's fair to put a uh, certain level of, uh, I guess, input in regards to certain decisions that are made on the roster or, you know, the, you know, the overall team on those young guys, on Brandon and, and Zion. And, I, and, I, and I, I do agree with that. But the reality of the situation is you're going to have to do, you're going to have to one way or another find a way to make those two happy. Mainly, more than B.I., Zion. They both went out of their way to say as much about Lonzo Ball. <laughs> I heard Zion say things about Lonzo, and the question wasn't even about Zo. He found a way to say we want him back. Like, there's, there's, there's messaging, cold and thrown, thrown out there. And I mean, and, and through the article that was, you know, that was out today, he said that they both privately and publicly have, speaking, have, have spoken up for him. And that's fair. I mean, I, I think at the end of the day, I agree with, with Jesse that you have to do what's best for the team no matter what but i also believe that 
if those guys want him back and you can get him and maybe, I don't know, you have to pay a million dollars over what your stopping point was, you have to do it. Um, if it goes too far over there, I, you know, I made a joke about the 30 mil push. You can't, you can't pay him that. And, and, and everybody will, everybody understands that that won't happen. Well, I mean, I, at least, you know, I would hope, but um, I think if anything, it puts a little bit of extra nudge towards Griff to say, okay, right. Well, if we're stopping at 20 mil and 22 is on the board, you might have to take it. And I, I just, it, it, it sucks that, that, that that's the way that it is, but I think that that's the game now. I mean, in your job, in every, every job, no matter what, connections matter. And, 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 and Lonzo is in a world right now that even, even as he continues to try to improve his game, even as he tries to figure out who he is as a player and figures out what, what his market is and what his fit's going to be long term, he has one of the, you know, league's, you know, best and youngest, brightest superstars in his corner. I, I just can't foresee a way that that doesn't end up leading to him returning to the team. Jesse, Justin, do you guys have thoughts on this? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to say uh, probably one more thing, and I'm going to go ahead and get ready to get on the 9 o'clock broadcast. But um, um, basically, uh, on, on the subject of Alonzo, I think, you know, if you can bring him back for the right price, uh, I, he, he is a valuable player and serviceable player and, and can be a good asset to a team, I believe. As, you know, as far as his talents go, I know nothing about him personally. Um, and what it's like in the, lo in the locker room. But as far as the on-floor product, I think he plays fine. I think he plays well with uh, Zion. Um, you, you can't overpay for this guy. Um, maybe, maybe the team can afford like a slight, you know, small overpay, like, uh, like Chris said, for about, you know, maybe a million over or something like that. Um, and maybe it is good for the locker room overall. But at the same time, uh, Griffin has to be aggressive and make uh, – I, I think the as far as teams – as far as players coming back or going away, uh, they just need to make sure that whatever is incoming is an upgrade. They're going to take note if guys are leaving, and there's no upgrade to replace that. Um, I, th I think that's all that really, really matters. And, uh, yeah, as far as Griffin goes, um, I – I, I want to take a minute to defend him a little bit. Like I, you know, his press conferences are are goofy, but <laughs> um, <laughs> nice. But uh, I, I will say, you know, the Anthony Davis thing came down. They stockpiled uh, full of picks. They got, you know, rights on picks for years. They got young players that have a ton of potential. Um, this year didn't go that great, and I think people are very focused on. The idea that, you know, Steven Adams is there and Bledsoe is there and it didn't elevate the team. And they're really focused on how much they played and they're focused on the idea of those guys being uh, pieces around Zion. I, they were never considered to be the real, true, long-term pieces to be around Zion. I, I don't think anyone in their right mind should really, really believe that. Um, I know some people say that on Twitter, but uh, – the, the true assets are the picks and the picks hold more power than anything else. And if you are building a new regime, you're going to want those picks and that's what's important the most. Um, and, you know, it's possible maybe uh, Van Gundy got Byron Scotted. You know, he didn't play those younger guys as much. And um, yeah, I, that's, that's totally fair to let go of a guy for that. I think, you know, if, if your uh, future is in those younger guys. And when those younger guys did get more minutes, I feel like we saw more wins, um, especially towards the second half of the season, maybe not in the beginning. But, um, you know, um, he's goofy, but I think, like, he has done some things to set the team up for some su success down the road. Um, and I think he deserves some credit for that. Um, that doesn't – develop immediately right away um Bledsoe is not was not an immediate solution piece you know it's those are things that you have to do to make those trades work and facilitate them I don't expect 
you know, those kind of guys to be in the fold for very long, you know. Um, so, you know, I, I, I feel like their situation may be a little more positive than get it, given credit for. It's just a lot of piling on right now. Van Gundy being out. Then you have these, you know, rumors with Zion and things like that. But if the plan develops a little bit like it's supposed to, I think, I think you can have some of that talk be erased. All right, Jesse, before you go, yeah, <laughs> yeah. before you go, I know you got to head out, which we appreciate you joining. Nice uh, debut for Pelicans Plus. And your co- or your pick to be the next coach of the Pelicans, because we're going to be talking uh, all about that. Well, my favorite pick would have been Teresa Weatherspoon. Uh, Griffin calmed that down. Um, but honestly, I don't know much about the candidates going up there. You know, we were just talking about um, Chris. What, is it Chris Lee? Charles Lee. Charles Lee. Yeah. Charles Lee. Uh, I've heard people say good things about him. Uh, I know uh, Fletcher Mackle's really uh, big on Charles Lee and is really big on Becky Hammond too. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, um, I, it, sure. But, um, you know, I, I'm hoping it's not Jason Kidd. I think there's a lot of baggage there. Um, and I, honestly, uh, odds, odds. You know, they, you know what they should do? They should double down and, and, and get Jeff Van Gundy. That's what they do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, I, I, Fred Vincent could be a dark horse too. Yeah. I've seen that. Yeah. 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 I've, I've seen his name, his name being, being thrown out there. You know what? I'm going to say Fred Vincent just because somehow he's not been eliminated from this franchise. <laughs> he's been there longer than the Bensons. Yeah. Yeah. He has. So he has. Jesse, thanks so much for joining us. We'll talk soon. <laughs> Um, and his pick, Fred Vinson. Well, Chris and I, Chris, Justin, and I will talk about that as well in just a moment here. Jesse, go do your job, man. We appreciate yeah. you. You guys take care, man. Hi, right, Jesse. Bye. Okay, guys. Uh, Justin, did you have anything to say on on the topic of Lonzo before we? Start? Yeah, I mean, I got, I got. <laughs> um, of course, Jesse is now off the uh, <laughs> off the podcast because I wanted to kind of talk about what he said. Um, first off. I don't mind what I think with Griffin, I'm high and low on Griffin, right? I, I think the Eric Bledsoe thing, like I'm not that whatever, like I understand why he did it. Uh, the Steven Adams extension really irks me. And a lot of people say, well, you know, he's an expiring and, and you know, not this year, but next and things like that. They didn't need to extend him. They just basically wasted money. And now that wasted money now is, is it 17 or 19 million? I 17 can't. and a half. 17 and a half and Bledsoe's getting 19. I mean, God, right. That's $36 million right there. That's basically being wasted. So you have to get off of those guys. If you want to, here's the thing now, Zion's come out. We got a new coach. There's a lot of heat on Griffin. They got $36 million tied into Steven Adams and Eric Bledsoe for next year. Like you got to get off of them in order to get somebody right. I I don't know who we're going to target or free agency or drafting or trading. Um, because I actually like Lonzo Ball. I, I think he's a good player. I really do. I think he has to work on his penetration game. I, that was that came out weird. But, uh, like he's got to be able to. He's I'm like I man. I'm like able, he has a child already. The thing, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> now throw it off. What I love about Kyra Lewis's game and Nikhil Alexander Walker's game is that they break down the defense. Lonzo Ball doesn't really do that. Elliot, you got to stop. Um, okay. Did you hear what Chris said? <laughs> He said I, he kind of mumbled it. <laughs> he, said, <laughs> man, he already has a kid, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Oh shit! No, I thought like I was going to go with that. Anyways, <laughs> I think he needs to break down the defense a lot better. He needs to get to the free throw line a lot more. Now we've seen the shooting; it's progressed with Vincent, especially. Um, I think his decision making in transitions fantastic. Half court offense, I think he's been better. Uh, he's not great. I think he's been better. Um, defensively, I think he's a like I think he gets a lot of flack for having really bad defenders behind him. I mean, Brandon Ingram is one of the worst defenders in the league. Steven Adams is not great. Eric Bledsoe is extremely overrated, and Zion is twenty years old and 
doesn't really understand concepts yet because he's been the most athletic guy on the court throughout his entire year. Uh, so I personally like Lonzo ball now to, you know, to Chris's point, do we pay him 25, 26, 27? No, you don't pay him that much money, but if it's $21 million, I mean, yeah, I, 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 I don't know what else to say. Like who, who replaces Lonzo ball? That's the bigger question. Who's going to replace him? And Kale Alexander Walker's the two, right? He's better. He's more efficient off the ball. So who's your one? Kyra Lewis isn't ready. You got to start winning. Think. No, Kyra's not ready. I love Kyra too. He's not ready. Jump, but he's a secondary point guard now. It's like, like you look at the free agent market, right? You got Kyle Lowry, you got Gordon Drogic, like you got uh, Mike Conley. Like, are you going to pay those guys? Like, who I mean, you, who's your starting point and, guard? Unless you, I mean, and that was, that was to my point earlier, unless you feel as if, you know, you have something in the works that's going to bring back somebody that's, um, that makes sense. Right. Um, I think you're worrying about the wrong things when it comes to Lonzo, unless we're talking about a $25, $26 million situation, right? The, the real focus, and it's not even, um, you, you know, for me, uh, it's not even just Steven Adams or Eric Bledsoe by themselves. And we talked about it before. It's, just, it's them together. That's the issue here. It's them being together. You get sure. one away from the, you get one away from the other, you know, you probably have a different, a different situation. Completely you're able agree. to do that. You're able to do that. Everything else starts to, at least, I mean, you know, for me, I, I think starts to play out um, along with the guys that are, that are individually getting better. And um, I mean, look, I, I, you know, they were, they looked as if they would, they, they had a chance to start a, to turn a corner once the Carol Alexander Walker got into the starting lineup. And I, and I really thought before, um, before he got hurt and Lonzo was on his way back post all-star break, I really thought they had a good chance to put Lonzo back in, put Eric Bledsoe in a secondary role. Um, right. And you may, and you, and at that point you may get better in, in multiple ways, but that starting lineup that could have been of Lonzo, Nikhil, uh, Brandon, Zion and Adams, you can win with that. For and you sure. can also defend with that because Nikhil brings you out of that group uh, he's your, he, he gives them something that they thought they were getting from Eric Bledsoe. And that's someone who can, who can guard these quick point guards high and these high screening roles. Like that's not really, that's right. while Lonzo can do it. I don't think that's where you get the best out of him. That if you want to get the best out of Zoe, he's probably best served off ball or guarding guys that are, that are closer to his size, a little bit, a little bit slower and, you know, uh, and foot speed, but asking him to go out there and guard Damian Lillard, you know, uh, you know Jamal Murray and company is just not uh, night in and night out, pick and roll after pick and roll. It's I don't think that's what's going to work best for him. And I mean, especially coming off a, a year where you know Drew Holiday was the one that had that assignment, like so it, it it put too much pressure on him when you're when the guys around you, as you mentioned, Justin, have so many other flaws behind you, right? Um, so yeah, I, I, I think that we need to, you know, the focus needs to be less on Lonzo and more on figuring out what you're doing with either, either Eric Bledsoe or Steven Adams or both of them. And Chris, I, I wanted to piggyback your point here is that, and that's why I think started like the little riff, right? Like we all were like, how is Eric Bledsoe still starting? Like, why is there not an adjustment being made? Like, how is no one else starting? Cause he's just, he just wasn't good. Now, if you put him on the second unit, I bet you'd be pretty good. I bet you he could run a really good second unit with like a Jackson Hayes, like a Kyra Lewis, like whatever, you know, we got to mix and match and stuff like that. Billy Hernan Gomez, fine. But Van Gundy just never pulled the cord. And then obviously Nikhil Alexander-Walker got hurt. And then Josh Hart's out for the year. And then just it literally, it literally just snowballed. Um, Stubborn. Yeah. And I, and we will not, we'll never know. Maybe I'm sure people are like, you got to start and kill Alexander Walker. And Sam Van Gundy might've been like, no, I'm not. And it is what it is, you know, and the rest is history. But to your point, Chris, I agree. I think, uh, I think Lonzo has tough, you know, is, has he guards better with, 
you know, height and length than small, like Murray and Lillard. I completely agree with you, but I mean, let me ask you this. And I want an I want your point on this too. How much would you pay Lonzo to stay in new Orleans though? Cause we keep saying like, what is too much Chris? And you can start first. <laughs> never, I, I never, I never know how to how to answer this question. I, I, I don't. Um, I guess for me, I would really, I would really want to know what the market is in a sense, because because it's hard. I mean, I don't want to pay him twenty five million dollars a year. Neither but, do I. But what the hell is my alternative? Like, I mean, that that's that's what I'm looking at. I mean, am I a year from now? I'm saying, damn. Smart. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, you know, what the what the hell is my alternative? If 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 the Pelicans say we're not going over 23, but he's offered, but he's offered 25 and you gotta match it, I probably close my eyes and sign the fucking check. Like, you know, I, but I don't want to. You know what I'm saying? So I I I it, it's it's tough, man. Because if now, you if, I'm put you off. if you if you sign him for 25, right, and you get off Bledsoe and Adams, somehow, some way, somehow, some way, you create cap space, but still sign Lonzo. That's my problem with the Steven Adams ex- extension is that we just wasted 17. Like, imagine if you just had $17 million right yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 and I mean, look, I personally think Lonzo is going to be worth um, 20 plus million dollars. Like, like I, I can't, I, I don't look at a player like him and say, what he is right now is what he's going to be in two, three years. Like he's gotten better every year he's been in the league. Now, I mean, he hasn't, he hasn't progressed in all the different ways that people want from their point guard or from their style of view of what a point guard should be. Uh, There are certain things he should have worked on a long time ago in LeVar's garage, you know, but um, regardless, I do know that he works hard and he's gotten better every single year. For me, that's somebody I'm willing to invest in. And given and given the fact that my two best players really, really want him on the team, I, you know, I, I go back and forth on this, man. Some days I'm like, you know, I ain't paying 25, 23 is it. And other days I'm like, all right, well, you know, 25 is it. I know I'm not paying 20, I'm not paying over $25 million. And I really don't want to go pay 25. I really want to say 23 is it. But this is a special circumstance. And that, that, you know, and then afterwards, they have to figure out, um, you know, and I get people, you know, it's like, all right, well, if you do that, those three have to work, you know, and if they don't, but I mean, look, yep. and here's something else. I mean, I think if you ask me five years from now, like, let's say, let's say they bring back Lonzo. If you ask me five years from now, who's more likely to be next to Zion? if Zion is still with the Pelicans, Lonzo or Brandon, I'd probably say Lonzo. So, you know, I, I mean, you can, you can, the things you can do with Lonzo in regards to different, different systems and setups and overall flexibility, it fits a little bit better than where Brandon is right now until he consistently wants to defend um, and they open this damn, this damn floor for him. So, I mean, there's there's so many different layers to it, man. But I, I, yeah, I think now I'm at I, I'm at 25. But you asked me tomorrow, that might change. Wow. I wanted no. I wanted to ask you before I get this. I know we're on the topic, Elliot. I want you to answer this. Do you think Brandon Ingram is being that petty to where I'm not gonna play defense if Stan Van Gundy gets fired? Like, do you think like Brandon Ingram was like, I'm not gonna do shit for you? <laughs> Uh, like, like I'm like there's no way he could be that bad of a defender. Like he was terrible. Yeah, I kind of. I I, I could definitely see it, especially <laughs> well, after that tweet that I'm sure we all saw about him with music in the gym putting up shots. Um I I could see it. I don't know that we have ever seen that as the media, like with him talking and stuff like that. Obviously, the little shots to LeBron and stuff like that, but I mean, there's got to be some level of explanation like that. Supposedly, their relationship was awful. I mean, I, to be as horrible as he was, and th- here's the thing, Justin, is I don't know. I think this was last summer. I still remember this. 
Chris and I were on a pod. This was with the previous podcast. And we were talking about who's going to be their next defender on the wing, a wing defender. And is it going to be somebody free agency? Or are they going to make a trade? And Chris said, Brandon Ingram needs to step up and be that because he has the physical tools to do the, to do that. And the basketball IQ, but he didn't do it. He didn't do anything near that with a defensive minded head coach. It's gotta be partially the relationship. And, and that ties in his willingness to listen and to watch film. And I mean, when you become resentful of somebody who's supposed to be your leader, you're a bell, right? Rules without relationship equals rebellion to quote the great John Mosley from last chance you, you know, that's, and, I, and I've referenced that a lot with, with their relationship. I mean, and on top of that, SVG is an abrasive guy. I don't know. I don't know any other real explanation other than, you know, lack of effort and that relationship because BI is too smart and too gifted in terms of his, well, talent and uh, in frame to be as bad as he was this year. I just, I, I really wish I knew what, what happened there because Brandon is someone who asked to be coach hard. He's been very vocal about wanting people to hold him accountable. He's been very vocal uh, publicly about knowing that it starts with him defensively. I'm sure, you know, Zion is alone with that, but in his mind, as one of the leaders on the team, that that the activity on that side of the floor should start with him. And early in the season, especially in the preseason, we saw that from him. A lot of deflections. He was energized. He was, I mean, any he was using his length, doing, you know, doing everything that you really ask for him. I mean, we're not asking him to be a lockdown defender by any means. Just be attentive, be aggressive. Use your length, communicate, move your feet. That's it. Um, but something, something switched. Something happened, and I, you know, and I'm really, you know, I'm really curious. I mean, I mean, if if it got to a point to where you know Brandon was just like, okay, Stan is just getting on my damn nerves. I can't relate to this guy. He's not listening to me. Was Stan disrespectful to him? You know, uh, I could definitely see Brandon taking that and going, you know, and going sideways, but. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, that's not, you know, I don't even want to use that as an excuse. You know I mean? I, I get it. That does, that does happen, but listen, man, you're making, you're making a big money on the team. You are one of the leaders. It is your, it's your job to set an example, no matter what's going on with you and the coach, you're a hell of a competitor. You want to win. You want to be great. You mentioned yourself about how you don't even see the game as being a two-way, you know, or, or, or being a two-way player. You, you know, you, you acknowledge defense is, is a big part of the game. You should want to be a good defender. Um, he has a part of accountability uh, as an individual that he has to uphold to as well, no matter what's going on with him and Stan. So, um, you know, there's some, there's a, there's a part of him that has to look into the mirror. I, I, I really wish, and, you know, I don't know if we'll ever know what truthfully happened there, you know, but um, I, I mean, it, there's there's no mistake about it. I mean, they at some point he is going to have to improve. I mean, and then, you know, there's there's the other element of I, he had to work really hard just to duplicate what he did last year, or you know, or, or the season. Uh, yeah, yeah, last season he had to, he he had to work really hard with you know horrible shooting to duplicate what he did with a better roster with Drew Holiday and company and some of the other options that they had on that team. So uh, I don't know, man, get a, get a better roster, get a younger coach that he can talk to, man. And, <laughs> and, you know, hope he really takes this off season, works on his body and his conditioning and it works out. And all right. Hey, Justin, we're 40 yeah. minutes in and we haven't talked about a coach yet. Okay. So go. We go got it. Yeah, we got, go. we got a transition yeah. here. We could talk yeah. about that for so long. And if this was a little bit longer format, we definitely would. But what names are we talking about here? Chris, I know Jerry Stackhouse is your guy. Justin, Chauncey Billups, Sam Cassell, 
Uh, for me, I've got a few different names in there as well. Teaspoon, um, Fred Vinson, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Oh, also, I'm, I'm a big fan of Emi Udoka from what I know. But if you guys had a choice, just one choice, and maybe make it a little more feasible, like a name we've heard already, but if you want, you can talk about whoever as well. Um, Justin, you go ahead. Uh, it's tough. Um, it's Rick Carlisle. <laughs> uh, I've always been, and I was, uh, I forget who I was talking to on Twitter, but I've, I've always been a huge fan of Rick Carlisle. I think he's a top five coach. Uh, someone had asked me probably about a year and a half ago, who you're like your top five coaches. And I had Rick Carlisle with like Spolstra pop and you know, whoever else. Um, I really, really like him. I don't think the Pelicans are going to get him. And to Chris's point, I think he's too kind of just these guys need just a younger dude or a woman, right? Like they just need someone younger that, that they can relate to. And that's why I think they missed out on Stan Van Gundy is that like, they could like, they just couldn't relate to each other. Right. And Stan Van Gundy's old school, Brandon Ingram's new school. It just didn't match. Uh, I personally really, really like Chauncey Billups. Um, he's been talks, you know, first off, he was a great player. He's a great leader. He's a champion. He's a winner. Uh, now, does that relate to coaching? No, absolutely not. But he's been um, talked about being a general manager for a basketball team. Now he's on a coaching staff, especially a really good coaching staff. Uh, I personally think that he's a great choice. He's young enough. He's been removed from the league as a player for, I don't know, a decade or so. It's not really that long. He understands the game. He's intelligent. Um, and he's a leader. He was a leader on the court. He'll be a leader off the court. That's that's usually how it goes with coaching. And I just think that Brandon Ingram and Zion Williamson need a guy that they can relate to as, as Chris was Chris's point. Like you can't get, this is why the Rick Carlisle thing probably won't work is that he just might be a little too old school. You know, Luca, Luca Doncic couldn't relate to Rick Carlisle. Like let's, you know, does, do you think Zion will then too? I mean, I go with Chauncey Billups. Um, do I think we get him? I, I give it a 50 50 shot. I really don't know. I don't know who's on Griffin's radar to be honest with you. Cause he does a great job keeping everything hush hush, but uh, my choice is Chauncey Billups. Chris, you go ahead. Um, up until the press conference, I really thought it was going to be someone in house. Yeah. And, I, and I don't want to necessarily throw, throw it out just based off the press conference, but, and then listening to what, to what uh david said and then some of the things that came out you know they came out today you know you get the feeling that griffin i mean and and actually it was in i think the article from yesterday griffin wants to be involved in rotation and he wants to be involved in uh you know lineups and like he 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 wants to be hand on hands on beyond just you know uh setting the table if you're going to do that, it's hard to bring in someone like Stan, who's been doing it longer than you, right? Who's been involved in coaching uh, for a long time, who has led multiple teams to, you know, to different forms of success. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I could understand Stan being like, yeah, yeah, okay, you don't know shit about coaching, man. I, I you know, I got this. I've done this. You know, I'm comfortable with what I'm doing. So, if that's true and that's what he wants to do, it, it it's kind of hard to see him bringing in someone really established that has a that has a, a resume already. So um I mean that's where you start talking about the Charles Lees of the world. Uh, you know, you start talking about Ime Udoka or someone on the someone like, you know, Teaspoon, who I thought um would be wonderful because I don't think the team is that far off, man. I don't know how they're going to, which route they're going to pick to to get to where they need to. But, you know, they just need a little bit of seasoning and a little bit of managing in the right and, and, and here, here and there. Um, and maybe, you know, ho hopefully fix up whatever friction was there in the locker room. And you're looking at a team that in their, uh, for the most part, in their third year together, that could, I think, make a, make a huge jump. Um, my favorite, Outside of Jerry Stackhouse, this is your guy, Elliot. Um, I really like Ime Udoka. I think that he, he he crosses so many boxes. I mean, he comes from, you know, uh, 
the you know the best coaching family tree that we have in basketball out in San Antonio who as an organization has been you know elite for 20 plus years now uh, he can relate he, he's not he's not too old he's not too young he's seen a bunch of different talents he got a chance to learn from one of the greatest coaches ever uh, he was a role player so he can relate to guys that are you know that are gonna be that are still gonna be trying to find their way but he also played with superstars from Tim Duncan and uh, he was around he was around Kawhi and uh, he, Manu and Tony he was on those championship teams he's also a champion uh, there's a bunch of different things there, and he has experience when it comes to to coaching, and has been around a bunch of different individuals there and through his time um, in San Antonio that made a difference. Now, I'm very curious uh, as to why. I'm actually surprised that he, that, that he hasn't been um, he hasn't he, he hasn't gotten his crack yet in regards to being a you know a uh, a head coach. Uh, I know he interviewed for I think Charlotte la- uh, either the year before that. La- the last time that they had that they had an opening, I remember him him being a name that was thrown out there. His name always seems to be there, but he crosses a lot of boxes there. You know, the smooth dude. Um, you know, you know when you when you hear him talk, and a lot of people have great things to say about him because I did research on him. I think um, when I thought the Pelicans were going to fire up Alvin Gentry. And when you and, and he's one of those dudes that a lot of people around the league have respected since he's gotten into coaching. Um, so that that would be my favorite pick. You know, I'm just I think it all has to come down to um, what exactly does Griff want? How much micromanaging is he going to do? Because everybody just isn't going to be OK with that. If he's really going to want to micromanage. It's not going to be Chauncey Billups. It's not going to be, um, let's see here. Well, obviously Jason Kidd, which we don't have to talk about at all. Um, it's not, I don't, I don't think it would be Sam Cassell either. It's going to have to be somebody who hasn't been the been around the NBA as long as these people have. It's going to have to be a Charles Lee. It'd be a teaspoon. Sorry? Teaspoon. Yeah. It'd be a teaspoon. Teaspoon. Like he, he could be able to micromanage teaspoon. Charles Lee, Jock Vaughn, maybe probably not Jock Vaughn, but it, it's no, not Jock, no. it's it's caught between. I want to hire somebody that's good for the job, but I want to micromanage them at the same time. How do those two things coincide? Because I I they, don't think they they don't micromanaging they don't. is not an effective leadership style. No. It's a very it's never very poor it's one. never worked. No, it has not. It's never worked in any profession ever. The GM is the GM. The coach is the coach. Once the GM and the coach start, all bets are off. Exactly. I don't. I don't care. Like there are no good examples. Like no, I've hired you to coach this team. You go coach the team. Like that's it. Now, if he can somehow garner some self awareness and put this together this season and just take a step back. If we're talking about a holistic coach and to keep it a little more realistic, my, mine's probably going to be Chauncey Billups as well. Uh, Justin Billups, like the thing, I think, I think you said it, Justin, that the former play doesn't really have anything to do with coaching now. And I kind of disagree because he comes in having had that experience and players are going to respect him for that experience, right? He's an NBA. Right away. He uh, did so much in the league, top 20, 25 point guard of all time, probably. And he did a lot in Denver as well as Detroit and won a championship against Kobe and Shaq's Lakers. That's pretty damn impressive. And yeah, I don't know. I don't know if you saw I, the clip. Go ahead. I was okay. <laughs> I don't know if you guys no, saw the ahead. clip today of, it was an interview on Dan Patrick in 2014 during the draft. I think when Ben Simmons and um, Ingram were selected, was that 20, 2016, 2015? I don't know. One of those three years, somewhere in yeah. there. And Billups said he wouldn't take Ben Simmons first. He'd take Brandon Ingram. Show him that clip and talk about Brandon Ingram being like, okay, this might be my guy. 
you know? Oh, so yeah, for- Billups is, is, is right up there for me. He's been on that staff in LA with Ty Lu, with Kenny Adkinson. Um, he's been around really awesome coaches, probably his whole life. He's a guy that can relate to these younger players. He's been in the media too, just steps in and says, this is a, what we're going to do. This is why we're going to do it. Let's do it together. That's, that's the, the vibe that I get from Chauncey. And the fact that he's been there before adds a whole nother level to it. Now, in terms of getting a rising assistant, I also love the name Ime Udoka. I've listened to a few podcasts that he was a guest on. And it's one of those voices in the way he talks where you're like, this dude is a coach. You know, he, he's just very articulate, gets his point across and super good dude. I don't know a whole lot about, you know, the Charles Lee, uh, you know, Jock Vaughn doesn't really do it for me. Sure. He had a great bubble last year, but we've seen how much that really matters this year. And now in terms of continuity and making things work, I like, I like teaspoon. She, she's so, she just could be the perfect fit for this team because they need a coach that they'll run through walls for. That's what yep. they need. They did not have that in Stan Van Gundy, not even close. And maybe Fred Vinson can be that too. And he's obviously well-trusted on this team. I didn't think he had the personality to be a head coach. I watched a few videos and he, he speaks very succinctly. He's trusted by Brandon Ingram. That's a big thing. And he's trusted by Zion. So And Lonzo. And Lonzo, exactly. Vincent could be my choice. The one thing that makes me nervous about Fred Vincent, though, is he's so freaking awesome in his position. I don't want to say, hey, you're really good at this. You must be good at X, Y, Z, because that can be incredibly overwhelming. We had a, we had a, a, a fan ask me why I was nervous. That was, um, let's see here, who asked that question. It was Gil, Matt Gill, 12, uh, pretty consistent listener of the show. But that's what makes me nervous. I, I don't want to take him out of something that he's phenomenal at and put him into another niche and say, well, you're probably good at this too. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I wanted to get back to your Chauncey Billups point before I go into this is that I think that right off the bat, he will be well-respected. And I was trying to say that I just think coaching and playing are two different things. Like there's just, there's just night and day. Um, so I, that's why I love Billups because he'd be well-respected Brandon Ingram, Zion Williamson, like they'll like just attract to him. Um, with the coaching side of things, I, I think relationships are everything like that's just, that is, I was especially talking about one of my now. buddies. Especially yes. now. That is, you got to have a guy or a woman that those guys are going to go to work for like every single night. Like that's just building a relationship. And I don't think Stan Van Gundy did a great job and I don't know anything. Right. But I don't know necessarily think that Stan Van Gundy did a great job building that relationship with the Brandon Ingram or Zion Williamson. Um, that's where I think that, you know, Vincent has that already. Uh, he has that trust in Lonzo ball, Brandon Ingram, trust him, Zion Williams, all those guys. Now, He's really good at his job, right? He's extremely, he's one of the best in the league. If you put him to a head coaching job, who knows what happens? Um, I am interested to see though Teaspoon take over the summer league team this year. I think that's a really smart move. I think you got to keep her. Um, I've heard really good things of Corey Brewer as well, who's not really talked about much on the coaching staff, but he's actually really well liked from what we've heard as well. And Teaspoon takes a cake. I think Vincent's Teaspoon and Corey Brewer uh, need to stay on that staff. Um, but you have to build a really good staff too. Uh, D house. So it's going to be interesting. I, too. There's so many options. What's that? D house. Who's done a lot of work with Jackson Hayes. Yes. D S. Yes. Yep. Yes. Uh, absolutely. I just think there's so many different options. I, I don't know. It could be anybody. It really can be. <laughs> I, I don't know. Now, in terms of Udoka, too, this is a point I wanted to make. He's on the staff with the Nets right now, and he might very well be an NBA champion by the end of this year. As last I checked, the Bucks were kind of kicking the Nets' ass. But that also happened the last game, so not really sure how that's going to end. And he'll be coming from coaching Kevin Durant, who a lot of people like to comp Brandon Ingram to. So, you know, he's around Steve Curry. He's around Mike D'Antoni. And this team obviously needs help in terms of – 
well, offense right now, figuring that out, which is probably more about talent as opposed to coaching, but also Steve Kerr or Steve Kerr, Steve Nash is the coach. I think the Nets needed because of how good of a communicator he is. And I think Udoka can learn a lot from that. And that's going to be really beneficial to a young team too. Um, is there any other characteristics or, or specific coaches that you would like to have this team uh, take on or would be happy with? Maybe not your top choice, but be happy with for whatever reason. They have to. I mean, you 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 hit the, hell, the, uh, the nail on the head when you mention communication. Um, I kind of... Um, one of the scares when Stan came in was that everywhere he's went or both times he's had the opportunity to be around superstars, the relationship soured at some point. When he was with, when he was with Shaq in Miami, kind of soured. Shaq wasn't happy. Dwayne was young. So I, I, I mean, you know, but with Shaq, it didn't go well. Dwight, they won in Orlando but eventually that relationship soured. Um, he didn't have a superstar in Detroit. Uh, he just, I think he just wore too many hats there. And now um, leaving New Orleans, while, um, while Brandon isn't a, isn't a superstar, he is an all-star, you know, it, it's, um, and I haven't heard through the coaches that Brandon's had, had in LA, I haven't heard, I did research to look and see, oh man, I mean, did he have any issues with, you know, with, uh, with Luke Walton? Were there, were there any issues uh, with, with Byron Scott? Was there, you know, what, you know, has he had any, any problems or what happened with Gentry? But couldn't find anything really. Uh, so I, everything that, that I've read on him, they didn't back to Duke. Um, and even the things that Jerry Stackhouse has mentioned about him, you know, he seems to be a pretty coachable dude. So, and we haven't really heard what, what Zion, you know, what if Zion himself was unhappy in regards to some of the things revolving Stan Van Gundy, or if it was just his family that were upset about things involving Stan. Um, but you need someone that knows how to deal with today's top athletes. I mean, period. Someone who can communicate, someone who's clear with everybody on the team and knows you know, hey, man, uh, I want to treat you like everybody else, but you're not everybody else. Um, I want to hold you accountable, and I'm going to hold you accountable, but there's a way I'm going to do it. There's a certain way about it that I'm, that I'm going to do it. And it may not be cussing you out. It may not be yelling at you. It may not be throwing you, you, know, throwing you under the bus through the media. And that's where I think, think a lot of things went left for a lot of people in that locker room, the fact that, Stan, Stan was kind of, he, he held his tongue early, earlier in the year. He took accountability for, for a lot of things as well, but he did things that Alvin didn't do the year before really at all. Alvin, I mean, you know, you know, he would, he would say as a team, they didn't, you know, they didn't do well. We didn't do this. You could see when he would get upset, but he defended those guys a lot in the media when people came after them. And that's one of the things that they knew they could count on. Um, Stan was a little bit different in that in that landscape because, you know, if someone asked him a question, he's a straight shooter. He's going to tell you. I don't know if those if those players necessarily like that. On top of the fact that they're losing, and they may be looking at him and saying, "Yo, man, there are things that, from you know from your job that you're not doing well right now." But I can't call you out because if I do, you know, I, you know, I'm a, I'm uncoachable. Um, they they have to get someone who can communicate, knows how to deal with people, um, because the talent is there. They will figure out the X and O's. They have they they have the right people. All the assistants you guys named there are wonderful. I think are wonderful individuals. Um, they got a chance to play multiple styles. They somehow finished still top ten in pace this year. Um, but I think more than anything, like and like both of you guys said, but you know uh, Elliot, you kind of uh, stamped. They have to have somebody that they're going to be able to run through a wall for night in and night out. Um, it's just going to have to happen. Now, one question here, because you're kind of known as the Jerry Stackhouse guy, Chris. We got a question from Jerry Stackhouse for coach, part two. Um, <laughs> he's wondering, he or she is wondering, why 
Why isn't Stack being considered? Do you know? Like, we haven't heard any reports about him at all. Well, um, there, it was said that he had interviews that were that were on the table before he took the Vanderbilt job, and he took the Vanderbilt job. Um, from what I know, part of that has to do with the fact that he felt as if he shouldn't have had to wait as long as he did, because before he ended up uh, – he was he led the the Raptors 905 team, their their G League team that had right. Fred Van Fleet on it, and I believe, and Pascal Siakam to uh to a championship. And I think in his mind, right around that time, he deserved to have an opportunity to go somewhere. He was and, and, and at, we had already passed the passed the time where where players were retiring one day and becoming a coach the next day. So we had we had passed that. He had actually spent his time earning his coaching, his, you know, his coaching chops and look at Nick Nurse, for example, before, before Jerry was Nick Nurse, Nick Nurse got a, you know, got a job with Toronto. I think Jerry kind of felt he shouldn't have had to go to Memphis to be an assistant. That was the time in which he, he was supposed to be a head coach. He left Raptors 905 to be an assistant with Memphis and then started interviewing. And I guess he took the job at, you know, at Vanderbilt because maybe he felt that was the bigger challenge. I'm not sure, but I mean, he's still he's he's still there. I mean, we know how these names work. A lot of times they run off momentum, right? Like Becky Hammond was one of the hottest names on the market a few years ago. I mean, her name's thrown out there, but she's not a favorite anywhere. Um, you know, um, I, I, I I don't know. Sometimes it's best to get these you know to get these guys or these women when their names are hot because right after them a new hot name is coming up and then it it continues to be a cycle so um i'm not sure what's going on right now i do think jerry eventually is going to be a head coach in the nba but i think the timing of it just got just got squared away weird and there was a time for him to to really be a head coach somewhere should have been after he won the championship with the g league team um they had a lot of players that ended up being really good players around the league and especially for Toronto. So. Right. Chris, I know you convinced about 95% of Pell's Twitter that he should be the next coach with that article. Um, I'll put that in the description as well. And I always, anytime this coaching thing comes up, I always reference that article because Chris did an awesome job. Um, now, it shouldn't, I don't mean to cut you off. It shouldn't come up this much, right? That That's kind of the problem. Yeah. That, why does this keep happening? But yes, Chris, great work. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're right. You're right, Justin. Now, we already talked about uh, Rick Carlisle, a possibility. Mick the Real Kang. Mick the Real Kang. Oh, man. These uh, Twitter handles are killing me. I'm not going to answer every single question because some of them were a little bit rough. But um Two more things before we let you go, fellas, because we are going over time a little bit um, from from fans. Uh, Cap Ellen RFC is his handle. Is wondering what we think about Chris Stapps Porzingis, uh, Justin as as a possible trade target or whatever. Justin, I think I saw a take from you on Twitter, so I'll start with you here. Just no. I don't know, <laughs> Chris. He's one of the softest players. I mean, he's a seven foot three spot up shooter I, I i if you're gonna be seven three i'd be able to play in paint like no like he, that showed me everything that boban had to play the five because chris Stapps was not willing to go bang in the paint like that shows you who he is i'm i don't know um that's my answer is just no chris he's not the guy no 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 i and and, and look it's, it, it's not that um Everything, everything that, that Justin said, I have a problem with as well. I mean, they would be a fit for him on the team as, as you know, this type, the style of play that he wants to uh, bring because you wouldn't need him to to bang down low. But my issue with Chris Stapps is that um, he's already unhappy with some things in Dallas in regards to role and, well, reportedly, and the situation with Luca and, you know, how, how are you going to go from that to come into New Orleans where you're the number three guy, uh, you know, and then bef- he, he, he didn't want to come to New Orleans um, before he even got to Dallas, because remember that was one of the, uh, the early Anthony Davis uh, deals that were being talked well, that were being worked for it. But Chris Stapps didn't, didn't, he, he didn't want to come here. Um, different, different organization and, and, and situation now, but 
uh, nonetheless. I, I just don't see it's a lot of money. He's often injured. Um, I'm not sure how he meshes with this group of guys and what they and what they're going to need versus what he individually needs. Send him to Orlando. <laughs> I mean, like, I, I know, like, we keep talking about, like, a stretch five and everything like that. Like, I don't consider him a stretch five, he, and he's 7'3". I, I just, like, in my mind, I think of a Brooke Lopez that can, like, actually defend the rim and things like that and, like, can grab boards. I think Chris Stapps hangs way too much around the perimeter. And, Chris, to your point, like, he's not healthy. He's he's literally, you're wasting money at that guy. But, oh, God, what? Listen to this. This Do you guys watch or do you guys like Kevin O'Connor? Yeah, yeah, he, yeah, he's okay. Okay, I'm I'm a fan of Kevin yeah. O'Connor. His segment from The Ringer called The Void is is pretty solid, and he did a segment uh, on Chris Stapps and his ineffectiveness. These are all of the injuries he's experienced in his career: left leg, torn ACL, sore Achilles, sore knee, sprained ankle, sore groin, strained quad, bruised thigh, right leg, torn meniscus, sore knee, sore hip, sprained ankle, sore foot knee tendon inflammation no thank you not for four years and a hundred million dollars that is is all over again (laughs) uh yeah hard pass uh you know maybe if he was cheaper maybe but uh, he he can't defend the rim anymore his lateral quickness isn't there he 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 gets caught sleeping all the time it's not and, and there's no post move besides a fade jump shot it's just the spacing five or whatever is is the ideal to match with Zion, I guess, but not <laughs> it's not freaking Chris Stapps. He's he's not the ideal to me. No. Now, while we're on this topic, this will be the last little point of conversation where we have a, a, a question from a fan. This is from Cody Allen, Cody Al underscore, and he says, "Rank your favorite trade targets for the Pels this off season." Uh, we'll just do one one trade target that's prob- that we should keep it a little more feasible. Pelicans are not going to get Jason Tatum. I know you guys are smart, but I just want to <laughs> lay that out there. Uh, anybody that maybe, not Dame uh, yeah, yeah, okay, shut keep up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, anybody that that sticks out to you guys that it's like that's possible and he would help a lot, even depending on a contract or what have you. Justin, if you have one off the top of your head, otherwise it looks like Chris has one too. I think, um, I mean, I've heard it for years, but Miles Turner, I mean, that's what I'd say. It's so impossible to like, he's just always a Pelican. Like sooner or later, he's going to be a Pelican because he's just talked about so much, but like, I just, <laughs> he's talked about so much. I don't know. I mean, that's who I'd say, but I mean, literally it's impossible, impossible to predict the trade market. Chris, take it away. Cause that's all I have. Well, Miles Turner, but from this perspective, I think that they're going to find a way to get rid of Eric Bledsoe. And when they do, there's going to be a hole at, at the shooting guard position. Well, I think Nikhil is the one that slides in and starts. He should, at least in my mind. So if he's starting, you don't necessarily have to get someone there. And, and, and I'm, 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 pencil, I'm penciling in Lonzo, Lonzo being back. So I think, I think that's your backcourt. Um if that wasn't the case and you were still having uh, an Achilles in a reserve role, maybe it changes it. But um, yeah, I mean, unless a big trade is happening, if we're basing this off of you think that the roster, you know, the core is going to be here, then that would involve you making a, you know, um, you know, uh, you can call it a lateral move. You can, I mean, there's a bunch of ways to kind of look at it, but I would say that, uh, Miles Turner will probably will probably make the most sense. Um, he didn't he didn't shoot the ball great this year. Uh, very 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 inconsistent from you know from there. Uh, but he is a threat. Um, you another guy that injuries I think may be a concern with him. Um, in regards to missing some time here and there, but I mean he's had back to back years where you're talking about a guy who is in the defensive player of the year discussion. And it's not just because he stands around the rim. Um, he's a guy who communicates, he can move, and he's going to help them. Like, you know, we talked about the coverage behind, you know, behind Lonzo. Well, he's going against these quick guards and he's pressing them up high, he's blitzing them, and a guy drives past them. And your help defense, your, you know, your, your help defenders are already, are already uh, 
struggling to, to say the least. And Steven Adams is not a guy who can move in space. Not a great shot blocker either. Miles Turner brings you someone who can move more in space. He can, you know, he can hedge, he can cover. Uh, he can, he can block and transition. He can, he can block, he can block shots standing, standing straight. Doesn't consistently get into foul trouble as well. Um, isn't a guy who's going to come threat. in demanding. Yeah. And, and he's a threat. He's, he's a not threat. demanding a bunch, that's it. you know, but he is a threat and, and that's it. I mean, that's really all they need. I, I mean, to me, so um, it's made sense for a long time now. I don't think he's going to be that expensive to, to acquire. Indiana's been trying to get him away for a long time. I, I'm, I'm assuming that may not be that far fetched for it to happen again. So, um, Miles Turner will be it for me. More athletic, much more fluid than Stephen Adams as a rim protector. That's that's a big deal right there because Stephen Adams looks like he's. I mean, we talked about Derek Favors being an old 29 year old. I, you know, I could model Stephen Adams running up the court. It's just like. I don't know. It's the weirdest like robotic <laughs> run I've ever seen in my life. Um, and uh, while not a lob threat, he's more of a lob threat than Steven Adams too. So, he's just and, better overall. Like yeah. he's just better. Like we tend <laughs> to say he's better than Steven Adams. Yeah. Flexibility. I mean, he's flexibility. A, I mean, he, that's what he, that's what he brings you. And, that, and that's really all they need. They need, you know, they need more, more options out there on the floor more flexibility, more threats, because you know, that your number one and number two guy are giving you 24 and exactly Zion's giving you 27, 28 a night. I mean, you're not concerned there. You just need more, more around, you know, and he's complimentary and he's, he'll come more cheap than another, you know, more all-star type of player generally, probably because of that injury history. And uh, he's, I mean, they've been trying to trade him forever too. Now we talked on our last round table about, CJ McCollum, uh, Ollie said that he doesn't think the Pels can get him without giving up Brandon Ingram. I, I, what? I would lean to, to disagree for sure. Uh, yeah. I, I think you can surround, I, I mean, it depends on what Portland does too. I mean, are, are they gonna, are they gonna blow it up? I, I doubt it. I think they're going to go out and get Mike D'Antoni and, and try to revamp what they've been doing over the last few years. But looking at, a possible sort of sign in trade with Lonzo and maybe attaching a few picks and, and one of the young one or two of the young players probably going to want a Jackson Hayes, which would freaking suck to give up. But what do you guys think about acquiring McCollum? I, before, before you answer that, actually, the thing about McCollum is he's another shot creator on a team that has very few. And obviously you don't want point Zion to be the focal point of your offense on every single possession. And I think what, you know, obviously you get rid of Zoe as your one, but McCollum can handle the ball. He's good off ball. Um, and you can put the ball in Brandon Ingram's hands. I, he's not the greatest facilitator in the world either, but you can, you know, I, it depends on what you believe about Kyra Lewis too. I'll, I'll let you guys talk. Go ahead, Chris. I I don't know if I'm huge on CJ. Um, I I respect what he can offer in regards to you know to shot creation and shooting and the ability to close if needed. You know he's 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 been on multiple playoff teams with Portland. Maybe a guy that may be looking for you know a fresh start. And I think um, those guys in the locker room talk a lot about about the the kind of leader that he is. Um, I just, for a team that I already worry about defensively, um, you know, at that, and and then, you know, at that point, is he, is he your point guard? You know, um, you don't, do you necessarily need one if you have Zion and Brandon? You, maybe you don't. Um, I like it, but then I'm also, I'm, I'm also slightly, you know, concerned with it from a defensive perspective, uh, because at that point, um, I still think in that in that situation, you'd probably want Nikhil guarding whoever the you know you're playing a an explosive point guard damn near every other night in the NBA. 
you probably haven't, you're probably putting the kill on that particular player and having McCullum guard off the ball. Um, so I keep worrying about the defensive part of things, you know, with them. But one thing I do like about CJ is that he's a run stopper and he does offer another, he does offer, um, you know, a sense of calm and composure that this team could use on that side of the floor. We watched them give up a lot of, a lot of leagues. Yeah. They couldn't get a stop in some case, but they couldn't score for a period of time, taking bad shots, taking, you know, taking ill-advised shots, you know, looking for fouls, looking for things. And CJ's a guy that he knows where to go. He knows where he wants to go. He knows how to manipulate a defense, whether he has the ball in his hands or not. He's a guy that they'll listen to. So maybe maybe I'm talking myself into CJ more, more as we're having this discussion. I, I'm just curious. Um, I, 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 I don't know, but maybe – Maybe that that is the optimum fit. I mean, when you when you have guys that can play, that can dominate the ball in multiple ways. You know, Brandon's a good facilitator. You know, when he's you know, I mean, I think an underrated facilitator. And Zion's only gonna gonna get better. He showed a lot of flashes this year. You may you know you may not need a guy that's going to be a prototypical point guard. So CJ could slide right in, but. I also think that you are going to – I can understand why someone would say you have to include Brandon Ingram because if Dame is committed to staying, I mean, is Jackson Hayes and, you know, is a few young guys in draft picks going to be enough to get it done? Because at that point, I think you're already – you're almost saying, all right, you know what, we're probably rebuilding here. We, we got to trade Dame next if you don't get a guy like Brandon Ingram in the deal back. So you don't think a sign-in trade for Lonzo – would be able to get it done, including those picks and like a young player. No, because I think I think Portland gets worse. Okay. Yeah, I, yeah, I think I, what, I, with their look, I mean, they they need help defensively too, especially on the perimeter. So no, 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 no. I I I agree. I just think I think it makes them, I think it makes them worse because the one thing that CJ does does do for them when Dame's out of the game, he's a guy who can go get you thirty, and the way that they that they uh, play with their lineups in regards. All right, they take CJ out six minutes in the first quarter, and they, they let him run for the second unit. You know, the sec. It just it works a little bit. It, it works there. I mean, you have to. I, I I don't know. I just I think if they trade CJ, they need. Um, I, I I could see why someone would say Brandon Ingram. I, I I don't know how much Lonzo would move the move the pin. I I think you're risking at that point. Dame saying, "All right, I need to go. I'm out here." All right, Justin, you go. If we have to give up Brandon Ingram for CJ McCollum, is it even worth it at that point? Like, no, right? What no. are we? No, it's just who's better, Brandon Ingram or CJ? Here's the thing, Brandon Ingram. And do I want CJ McCollum? Yes. Um, if it takes Brandon Ingram, then absolutely not. Uh, I was thinking maybe like I, I mean like I, I don't know. It's tough. I'd probably take CJ over Nikhil Alexander Walker, but like it's tough. Um. And it, it really depends. Like, are we signing Lonzo Ball? There's a lot of different, you know, variables. Um, Because you do have to have a point guard. And to y'all's point, like, I like point Zion. I don't like point Zion for 48 straight minutes. I like it for closing minutes. And I like it for maybe like a run stopper, as Chris was saying, things like that. Uh, you don't need to run point Zion for 48 straight minutes. So um, right. you got you to gotta get a point guard. And it literally goes back to our conversation. Well, if it's not Lonzo, then who the hell is it? Like, can CJ McCollum run a... Like, I don't know if he can run the one for, you know, 30 plus minutes a night. Uh, I like him as a player. I don't think he is. Uh, I don't think we get him. I think, uh, I think we got to think smaller. And I think we got to think it all depends on, to be honest, it really all depends on Lonzo Ball. I, I don't know what else to say. You know, we, we <laughs> say, you know, Pelican Twitter's in love with Bradley Beal coming to the Pelicans and Dane Lillard. Like, who are we giving up? Like, I love all these trade things. Like, who's take? If you're getting Dame Lillard or Bradley Beal, who is that going to take? It's going to take a Brandon Ingram. It's going to take probably to kill Alexander Walker and a couple draft picks. Like, I feel like you almost get even worse. Like, so I mean, it really depends on. I don't think we trade for a big star. I. A lot of people are like off on Brandon Ingram, and I don't understand. I get it. I I understand defensively he has to get better. He has to get better. 
but offensively he's special. He's a special talent. He's one of the best scorers in the league. Um, he makes really tough shots. He's a great three point shooter now with Vincent. Um, I think he does a great job off the ball. I think he, he can be better for sure. And I think to your point, Elliot, though, he had his career high in assists this year. He averaged five assists this year. It's the most, it's highest he's ever. And like, you can like shrug it off and stuff, but like at the same time, like that's a career high. So like, he's, he's like made a point of emphasis to like get the ball out a little bit more. Now he didn't really have many shooters around him this year. Um, I think everybody is tradable besides Brandon Ingram and Zion Williamson, in my opinion. I love Nikhil Alexander Walker and I love Kyra Lewis. I think you're going to have to get rid of one of three of Kyra, Naw, and Hayes. Uh, so I wouldn't fall in love with them to get a third star or a third player for sure. And you're not going to be able to sign them all. No, you're not. So oh. you, like, I, I love all three of them. I think they're great. I think Jackson Hayes, I think the world of Kyra Lewis, I think, I, and I love Nikhil Alexander Walker, but one or two of them are going to be gone in the next couple of years. We shall see how that will pan out, gentlemen. We just talked about the Pelicans for an hour and 20 minutes. Appreciate both of you. These are two OGs right here. Chris Connor is the impatient bull on Twitter. And then go follow Pro Pels Talk as well to check out Justin. And Jesse Brooks is Jesse C. Brooks as well. It's going to be a hell of an off season. So you can guarantee we, us three, will be back on a pod together fairly soon. Boys, thanks so much for joining the show. Obviously, always fun. Thank you, Elliot. No problem, and I hope all of you guys work on your penetration tonight.